What I've got in my hand here is the rear shock that we've obtained from Bitubo. So this is a high-end race suspension shock absorber for the back end of this BMW S1000RR. Now, we haven't put it on yet and uh, I just can't wait to do it because uh, I run my hands over it and I just know that this is a real quality uh, you know, piece of equipment. And, uh, but I had the opportunity when we were fitting the four cartridges down on the Gold Coast at Ride Dynamics to have a conversation with Joe Salter about the rear shock as well. So this video uh, is simply a recording of that conversation and uh, I hope you find it as interesting as I did in understanding what this shock is all about and uh, how it relates to its instalment on a BMW S1000RR. So this is a, a Bichubo rear shock. Um, this is the XXZ, the top of the range one. Now it has high and low speed adjustments for compression and rebound, which is unique in, in most of the road racing world. Um, it's like a, a, a TTX uh, or a KTEC DDS. It's a twin tube design. So in other words, oil flows in a circular motion inside these shocks rather than backwards and forwards. So a standard or conventional style shock, the piston does all the valving is in the middle here, and it's got shims either side. And so it pushes the piston through the oil, and the oil then has to transfer from one side to the other by, by opening valve or shim stacks. Um, it works quite well, um, but where it falls down is in repetitive, really fast motions, the oil can lag, and it creates a cavitation, and so then you lose dampening performance, basically. So. A twin tube design like this is, is a solid piston in the middle and it's actually pushing the oil through the valve up here. And so this is the rebound valve. On the other side here we've got the, the, um, the, the uh, compression valve. So as it pushes the oil through, there's a column, it's a 30 mil piston inside here pushing oil up into this valve and all the shim stacks and everything that, like that we spoke about earlier, it's all hidden up in here. Now, the oil, as a whole column of oil, gets passed through here into the reservoir. And so you turn your, your gold adjuster here is your high speed, and then Allen key in the middle here is your, is your low speed adjustment. On the return stroke, the piston is travelling back down, and so the oil comes through here and around the outside of the, of the inner chamber and back up to the middle here. So it, the oil goes up, around, and down again. What that does, it means the oil, or nothing has to stop physically and turn around and go back the other way yep. in terms of the oil flow. So it makes it a much more constant dampening performance. Now, one thing we always try and avoid is a thing called hysteresis, which is basically up and down oscillation that's not controlled. When you have cavitation, there's no dampening anymore. So that shock is free to do this. And what that translates to then, it's only minuscule movements, but what it translates to is on the rear tyre, the tyre starts having this pumping motion. And so the, the, on, on extreme cases, again, the gas block will go wow, 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 wave out of the corners, and you'll yeah, see right. this block sort of walk like this. What's happened is the shock has stopped doing its job and the tyre is now basically free spring. There's no damping on it. And so if we can minimise that, that load or that movement, the better the performance will be. So these twin tube designs really eliminate a lot of that cavitation issue we have with the other older designs. Now, like I said, they're both got the, this is the, on the top of the range one. High and low speed compression, high and low speed rebound. It's unique in, in most road racing terms. A lot of shocks do not have the high speed rebound adjustability. So it's a really nice feature. Um, gas pressurised. And because we run a twin tube where the, the oil is not forced to do weird things all the time, we can run a much lower pressure. The lower the pressure is, the less drag we have on the shaft seals here, which then means the shock is more sensitive to smaller bumps. Right. So the little tiny chatters in the road, this picks up and, and absorbs it better rather than just being a, a solid rod, basically. So win-win there. Uh, also, we have a remote preload adjuster in this one. Some models, like this Aprilia, RS660 shock, it uses a mechanical drive, so an 8mm or a 10mm hex on here yep. to change the preload amount. This one runs a hydraulic adjuster, so you, you wind this in, it pushes the piston down, which then pushes the spring down right. to add preload. Again, you add a, add a turn on it and it clicks too, you correct. can do it one mil, one click kind correct. of thing. That's right, yeah. So one full turn gives you one mil of preload, which gotcha. is really cool. Um, again, these things come set for the bike specifically, so the length is already basically the same as a standard shock length out of the bike, but it does have a feature on it where we can change the length of the shock. So on, on here, we've got a, a large hex, yep. a black one, and then a silver one. Yep. Now, if you loosen the silver hex, that takes a, it's a jam nut, takes the tension off the bottom here, 
and then we can turn this whole bottom assembly around. One full turn gives us one mil longer shock. Right. So we can adjust it up to a maximum, usually around six to eight millimetres, depending on the model. There's usually an indicator on the shaft of this here that is like either a hole drilled on the side or a machine groove. Once you see that below the height of the silver nut, that's as far as you go. Most of them, like I said, offer about a six mil adjustment range. So when we're talking about earlier on another video, how you put that bigger tire on there. Mm -hmm. Now, if you like how the bike behaved before that bigger tire, and you were just looking for the benefit of more traction on the bigger tire, well, when you fit that big tire, the bike does this. Yep. It raises the back a lot. Yeah, eight mil actually. Right. And so how do we get that back? What if you don't want the bike that tall? So in the BMWs, they have standard that flip chip. If you flipped it over to the low setting, you'd drop that bike back down. Interesting. Now, like we spoke about in that video, the, the BMWs ride too low for, for good corner performance. Yeah. And so adding that height makes it really nice. So what you're essentially doing is transferring weight to the front. Yeah. When you change the shock length, you're changing the, the, the geometry of the motorcycle, the swing arm angle and so forth. So usually we've got the, like a stroke amount here. Mm -hmm. Now that's, most bikes are around about 70 millimetres. Um, and the rear wheel's got about 125 mm yeah. travel, yeah. right? So yeah, at the start, it's, a, it's less than two to one. So for every wheel, wheel move, millimetre of movement, it's moving one millimetre here or a little bit more. Yeah. But as you get to the end of the stroke, it gets progressively stiffer normally. Yeah. So it gets harder and harder to compress the shock for given wheel travel. And what you do find is when you change this, you need to recheck your preload because you're changing the weight balance of the motorcycle and also where that, um, that linkage progression starts will change based on the length of the shock. So you may end up adding ride height to make the bike corner better or finish the corner better, but it can actually go worse because you've now made the suspension system softer. So now you're sagging more because the leverage on the rules changed. So you need to change your ride height and then recheck your sag just to make sure you're at the right starting point. Question about balance of the, like the balance between the front and the rear. Yep. The original setup on the uh, BMW, right? So if you matched um, the damping on the front and the rear, it had a tendency for the front to, uh, now I can't remember which one, oh yeah, the back wouldn't go down, but the front would go down a fair bit and then it'd want to tuck. Right, okay. Right, so there was this imbalance between the front and rear in terms of the settings, even yep. though they have exactly the same number of Yep. So is there anything to consider with these, this combination of by two, by front and rear? So as a, as a start, when I'm setting bikes up for people, we, we get the sag in the right window, so the bike is sitting in the right heights. Mm -hmm. um, if I know that geometry is an important thing for a particular bike, say like these things, I know they like to be re raised, I'll do that, then check the sags. Um, but then the dampening as an initial start, we looked at both moving up and down the same. Like the, the rate of up and down, they want to be balanced. Right. Like that bike to behave front and back the same on the bump that you're hitting. Right. Or the load given. Because otherwise what happens is, um, you know this from Superbike School, when you lean the bike over, the front needs to turn the handlebars in to match your lean angle. Mm -hmm. Now if you're going around a corner, that wheelbase is that long, and you're going around at that speed, that's that lean angle. And if you jumped off, that bike would come back and exactly right. where you were when you jumped off. Right. Now, all of a sudden, it hits a bump, the front wheel comes in, or up and back, so the wheelbase gets slightly shorter, right, and the rear comes up and back, so it's getting longer. So this wheelbase is constantly changing. So something needs to accommodate that movement, and that's the steering. So that steering's doing this a million times a second right. inside your hands without you realise. This is why when you hold tight in the handlebar, mm -hmm. the bike naturally wants to push wider because you're stopping that motion happening. So when we have our dampening, one, the, say the back's really fast and the front's really slow, you get this change that's not working in, in unison front to back. So the only thing that happens now is the handlebars need to accommodate more for that constant change that's going on that's bigger than it needs to be. So then the negative that usually happens is mostly naked bikes with soft suspension. The handlebars still have these ones are the rider. They get this rowboat effect going in mid-corner. Yeah. The balance is lost. So. Generally, you're looking for when you're setting it up, you push down both ends of the motorcycle. Should go down up together, right. even. That's a good start. But then as you do track work and, and various things, you start going the same direction that the rider's looking for. Stiffer front, softer rear, or vice versa. Yeah, right.